Hey, we had an email this week from Joseph M. on an 03 2003 Honda Civic, and uh, he uh, was just giving us some feedback. He was looking for a good shop. He had had his car into the dealer three times for an overheating issue, and uh, he just wasn't real confident, wasn't really getting a straight diagnosis. He ended up going to see Frank uh, and his crew at Desert Car Care uh, in the Southeast Valley and uh, really had a good experience there. And uh, thanks for the feedback, Joseph. I really appreciate you letting us know how the experience went. It ended up being a head gasket, although it wasn't a cheap job. It was an intermittent overheat, and I see this more and more yeah. with these cars. They won't overheat, they won't overheat, they won't overheat, and all of a sudden, bang, they'll overheat you know, out of, out of nowhere. And it's, it's these multi-layer head gaskets, I think, and they, they just get to the right temperature, they start leaking. Well, yeah. those overheats can be difficult to find at times. So, you know, Frank's guys definitely did a, did a good job on that. I mean, if there's, you know, the simple test is a pressure test or maybe a, um, we do a, a uh, hydrocarbon test or a block test looking for exhaust coming out the radiator. So that's going to be an indication that you've got a blown head gasket. But sometimes even with a blown head gasket, that doesn't work. You have to do what we call a leak-down test where you're actually pressurizing the cylinders with the valves closed, and then you're looking to find out where that air is going. It's got to go somewhere. It's either going to hold, it's going to come out the cooling system or the radiator. You can see the water start lifting out or some bubbles, or tailpipe or uh, or intake manifold if it's a bent valve or burnt valve or something like that. So. Yeah, I have seen that on the on the four-cylinder hunt. There's a couple of them. Well, uh, the attorney general is after... Uh Dirty auto shops and car stings. There was one this week. Again, so congratulations, Tom Horn. That is uh, something we, I like to see. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like to see it, but it's I don't love, like to see it. It's a love you know hate thing. Yeah. It, you know. I mean, he could he could just do that, do his entire you know workload and, and bus <laughs> shops because you see it a lot, unfortunately. Yeah, and, you know, Dave and I, Dave and I talk a little bit, and and we're of the belief that. I think there's as much incompetence right. as there right. is just right out Dishonest, thievery. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and this guy, Sun Valley Towing, Tim Kunselman, falls in the second category. Well, probably both. Yeah, He's probably both, incompetent probably. and I probably should watch him myself. <laughs> right. But I got I to have a special place in my heart for this guy because he burned me for a few grand. Uh, <laughs> you know, He had a taxi company a long time ago, and I was young and eager in 95. And I thought, oh, great, I got this fleet account, and I fixed all these cabs. Nah. He's a serial, uh, serial, uh, serial offender. Well, I mean, for, for our consumers, I mean, you don't want to be naive as far as uh, just picking any old auto shop. I mean, you're always very, very, very safe with the bumper-to-bumper shops. But also do a little research at the Better Business Bureau and some other things. So, yeah, And, absolutely. you know, part of that sting operation started off with towing. And we're going to talk a little bit more about towing coming up. And when you call for a tow, should, you know, should you listen to the tow truck driver? Should you listen to your friends? How about the dispatcher that answered the phone? And can you really trust the guys? And our first caller today is Gus calling from Sun City on his 2007 Charger. What can we do for you, Gus? You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Morning, guys. Uh, quick question. Uh, like I said, it's an 07 Dodge Charger. About six months ago, I lowered it using Ibox Springs. Um, I noticed the wheels are starting to butterfly. So I bought the front camber kit from Ibox, which is the upper control arm. And then also uh, the rear bushings. Now, my question is on the rear. With those bushings, um, once I install them, are they movable at all? Because I'm thinking I needed to take it somewhere to get aligned. But with, like, the front, it's like a, up on the ball joint. The Whoever aligns it, you know, will be able to get to it. But with bushings, my question is, can I do that myself, or do I need to take it to, like, a shop and let them do that? Well, I, I, I'm having a hard time picturing which exact bushing that you're talking about, but usually those bushings need to be pressed in and out. Um, so that's something that you're probably going to want to want to take to a shop. And then additionally for aligning the lower car, mm-hmm. it sounds like you got the caster kit or the adjustable ball joint. Same thing on the rear. There are some adjusting eccentrics, and they, and they probably make some aftermarket ones to overcome the the amount of adjustment that you'll need as a result of lowering. So, Well, back to your point in the first segment, we talked about front-end shops. You know, that <laughs> yeah. may be a job where, hey, maybe a front-end shop is, is, is a perfect place for somebody like Jackson Alignment where that's what they focus on and specialize on. So, Yeah, and then in the Sun City area, West Valley, Dave's Car Care, I know he just got that fancy new digital camera, you know, liner, super-duper ultra-liner deal so uh that that'd be a good shop for you in peoria i get tool envy every time i go to his place (laughs) (laughs) so but thanks for the call gus hopefully that helps you 
And uh, up next, we've got Justin in Mesa. He's got a question on his 2005 Nissan Altima. Justin, what can we help you with? Well, I, uh, I just bought the car a few weeks ago. We took it on our first road trip, and I checked the oil and everything was fine before we left. About 1,100 miles into it, I'd say oil light kind of flickered a little bit. And so I pulled off and checked it, and we were two quarts low after about 1,100 miles. And so that kind of got me a little concerned. I started doing some research and found out that, that it's kind of a big problem with the 2.5 four-cylinder Nissan engines that they like to, to consume oil. It's not leaking it. There's no puddles or anything underneath. Um, but a lot of people pointed to emit the pre chat and I was wondering if you guys knew of a any sort of way to tell if that was failing or, you know, if there's something else I should kind of be looking did for. You, you only have this thing for 1,100 miles. Did you check the oil when you bought the vehicle? I did. Yeah, so, well, I've had it for about, I've had it for about 2,000 miles, but it was 1,100 miles into our road trip that it decided to burn all the oil up. But, yeah, I checked it right before we left on the road trip, and it was... Hmm. And, and what did you, you said something about a pre-cat? Yeah, that's at least from what I was seeing online. They a lot of the Nissan owners say that it's something to do with the catalytic converter. They have a, a they call it a pre cat. I've never heard of it before, but they call it a pre cat that when it fails, um, it's supposed to let some of the vapors get back in and do some damage inside the engine. Yeah. Um, but there's no codes or anything that have been thrown, so okay. that's why I'm a little confused as to what I could be looking towards to try to figure out why it's leaking so bad. Okay, why well, it's not leaking but burning it up. And I'm not sure what they were talking about with the pre-cat. Usually if you're if you're consuming oil, that oil is going to go out the exhaust, and the ash in that oil will kill the catalytic converter. So that might be what you were reading. But if you want to send us an email, go to bumper to bumper radiocom go to the contact page, and send Dave and I an email, and we'll do a little bit more research for you. In the meantime, there's a couple of things you can try. I don't know if you're changing the oil yourself. Or, or if you use a shop, shop for your oil change. And most shops will have some, there's some cleaners. BG makes a product. Uh, Liqua Molly is a brand that you can buy yourself at Napa. They've got an engine flush. And you can try running some of that through the engine before you do your oil change. And if you don't do them yourself, just put it in maybe 10 minutes before you go to the shop. Add it, run it, get it nice and hot. You know, probably a 30-minute run time or look at the can. And sometimes that will help free up an oil control ring. Um, just remove some of the carbon buildup from the rings and, and, and maybe slow or stop the oil consumption altogether. So hopefully that helps you. Good call. Good questions. So <clears throat> back to this uh, Tom Horn thing. You know, we, lo- we like to see the bad guys, you know, get in trouble, but uh, it kind of points a negative light to our industry as a whole. There's a lot of great guys out there fixing cars. A lot of guys are honest. A lot of guys are straightforward. But yet, you know... The, few, the bad guys get all the press. I'd, I'd say the overwhelming majority are good people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's just, and again, we're probably going to run out of time. We'll have to bring this up again in our next segment. But when you, it, it goes back to what we always preach about. Establish a relationship with a repair shop before you have a problem, please. These people, go look at the Better Business Bureau report on this on this deal. There's 30, 40, 50 complaints or something like that. People aren't doing their research. Then you break down and you're in a jam. And then all of a sudden you got this slick talking tow truck driver from ABC Towing Road Service where, right. you, where you pay your membership and they want to drag you to their shop because he's getting a 20 bucks kickback. Or, or, you know, the other guy's got to deal with his buddy and they're, you know, they're paying him $30 or the body shop or, or whatever. So be, please, please, please be prepared before you have a breakdown and avoid these situations altogether. And Jim, you are up first, calling from Gilbert with his Montigua. I think that's a Mercury, right? Yeah, it's Mercury Montigo. How are you guys? Great. How are you doing today? Awesome. Hey, I got an AC on my car. I mean, it works fine when I'm driving, but when I'm stopped at a light or a stop sign, it just doesn't blow any hot air or blows nothing but hot air, kind of like me. Um, <laughs> but uh, just kind of figure out what that is. You, do you think it's a bad, a bad compressor or? Nope. Well, nope. That, nope. That, that's a pretty easy one. I mean, it, oh, good. If, if it's cool, but it could be two different things. The way you describe it, what's happening when you stop? You pull up to a stoplight, and what's happening? There's no air flowing across the radiator of the condenser. And the air, con- air conditioning condenser is out in front of the radiator, and that's where the air is going to cross, dissipate that heat, and then help the air conditioning stay cool. So you could have an electric fan problem. 
You could have a fan clutch problem where it's not spinning the fan fast enough to move any air. Or simply a low charge or problem. Or it could be simply low on charge. Probably not a big deal. Um, either way, any shop on the bumper to bumper radio.com site and list can fix that. Not a, not a, not a big deal at all. And Gilbert, you know, Frank's getting all the love today. Out in Gilbert, Desert Car Care. Go in there and tell Frank you're ready for some uh, huevos and crispy bacon. Yeah. You'll and, get the, uh, you'll get the repair if he cooks for you. Yeah. Yeah. That, tell that him. would be my stipulation. I would actually say that. Go in and ask for Frank. Tell him you're only bringing the car in on the day that breakfast is being served as part of our barbecue challenge. So, uh, next, Gail. We're going to get Gail calling from Phoenix on her two th- our 1998 2500 Dodge pickup. Gail, what can we help you with? On uh, 1998 Dodge 2500 four-wheel drive, the front ro- right wheel, underneath the rim, between the rim and the hub, there's a 3 16th of an inch spacer. And it says, on it, it says right front only. Okay. Um, you can put the wheel on it. Wheel spins fine without it. It, um, it looks like it was there from the factory. Are they oversized tires at all? Mm, the tires, the, uh, the tires are, mm, yeah, they're oversized. Someone, so, someone at some point put oversized tires on there to keep them from rubbing. They went ahead and put a spacer in between the wheel and the. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's only on one wheel, but it's been on there all of the truck's life. That may be the wheel where it was rubbing. Yeah, but oh. that that may be, but that doesn't make sense. It would be crazy to put a spacer. Did you use af- does it have aftermarket wheels as no, well? No, it's or? got factory hubs on it. Hmm, so to say it might even be a hub centric ring which you have to use sometimes when going to an aftermarket wheel to keep the thing centered on the hub. Oh, no. It, oh, no. If the other side it doesn't sound factory at all to me, I would probably be inclined to just take it off and throw it away. Just uh, get rid of it. Or at least next time you're getting a brake check or something, go to the shop and, and see if it makes sense to get rid of it. it. It's weird to be on one side and not the other in my book. Yeah, it would be kind of weird. Scott? Yeah, very weird. <laughs> <laughs> on one side. You're a man of few <laughs> words. Be, before I throw it away, I would, take, I would take it off, see what happens, and if nothing negative happens, <laughs> then throw it away. Yeah. And hang on to it. Don't throw it away. Just throw it in the back of the truck or something. So, well, thanks for the call, Gail. Sam, all the way in Tucson. Sam, what can we yeah, help you with on your Bonneville? Thanks. Yeah, I heard that my uh, belt for the alternator and compressor is lifetime. How long do these things usually last mileage and years? Well, I don't, I don't know of any lifetime belt at all. Um, you're going to get, depending on the driving conditions, temperatures, whatnot, you know, you probably want to start looking at the belt. What, 30,000? 30, 30, 40,000. Um, serpentine belts very rarely completely fail and break unless something else. I mean, unless they're really, really bad. You start seeing them start shedding some ribs. But it wouldn't be unreasonable to, to have that last 50,000 miles. Yeah, and that's then, a good expectation. And then the second time around, you know, we're finding a lot of the belt tensioners and the idlers that have bad bearings in them. Um you know, so if you're over 100, 120,000 miles on the car, you might want to look into changing out some of the tensioners and or the idler bearings while you're getting the belt replaced. Some of those are fairly inexpensive. I know in the Bonneville, the, the, on some of the Bonnevilles, the belts are pretty challenging. The motor mount's in the way, and the, the tensioner's hard to replace. We've actually got water running through through the belt tensioner. So, All righty, and we've got Blake up next. Blake's on a 2003 Dodge Intrepid. Blake, what can we help you with today? Uh, yeah, um, so just recently um, I was having problems with uh, the car starting up. It would, it, would tr- it would turn over and turn over and turn over, and then, and then it would finally start. So we replaced the, uh, some sensor, I forget what it is. But right now what it's doing is it's a transmission problem. I don't even know why I mentioned that. Um, it's a transmission problem. So now when I'm driving, like when I come to a stop, sometimes when it sets itself back in the first gear, it makes a really loud click. And then it won't go out of first gear after that. Okay. So when I start back up, it'll stick in first gear, so I have to pull over, turn the car off, and then start all over from the beginning, and then it'll start working fine. Okay, what's going on with that, Blake, is that's a Chrysler. The model transmission is an A606, and what's happening is when you're, when you're coming up to a stop, it's registering some sort of error, and it's putting it into a limp or a fail-safe mode. So when it's in a fail-safe mode, it's going to actually just lock it in second gear. So it's not going to downshift. It's not going to upshift. But that's just the the way to let you know you need to get it into the shop to be checked out. So the first place I would go would be to scan the transmission control module 
go in with a scanner and see what the code is. It may be coming to a stop. It may be a, a low reverse, you know, clutch, uh, some sort of gear ratio error. It could be a loss of prime with the fluid sloshing forward in the pan when you come to a stop. Now, he says he has an error, but and not it, an A-I-R error, E-R-R-O-R, an error. Right. Are you picking up my pronunciation, <laughs> sir? <laughs> <laughs> I am. And you have to be cautious because, you know, a lot of shops and even, you know, going to the AutoZone or the Checker or O'Reilly, mm-hmm. whatever, and they check the code, they, they don't always get into the transmission control module and they say, oh, you don't have a problem. Right. They, they're, you know, the yeah, little, the little th- handy readers that don't always, you know, yeah, and we've, those snap on. And know, we've, got, we've got the $1.98 mm-hmm. cent readers, too, to run out in the parking lot and do a quick check or check right. readiness monitors. But you really need a real scan tool to get in there and do that. Well, it's it's going to be, you know, a lot of times it can be something simple, something like a speed sensor or a loose wire, loose connection. So it doesn't mean you just need a transmission. Yeah. It needs to be diagnosed, and that code is just a starting place. Well, it's, and that's the other thing I want to say. It doesn't sound like he has a transmission problem, per se, with the actual transmission. This is a transmission control a control issue. issue. Right, exactly. Correct. Correct. So. And most of what we see is control issues. Dan, okay, fact or fiction for the day. I had no idea about this when I learned it myself, so I hope you know something about it. Uh, it's okay to put chrome valve cap caps on my late model vehicle. You know those little chrome valve caps you screw on? You know, makes your car look nice. It's like bling for your car. Is it okay to use those? You would call that uh, fact, I bet. As of this morning, you would have. I would have said that was perfectly fine. What do you think, Scott? I learned it this morning, too, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you say about Chrome? Uh, Chrome don't get you home. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, uh, I'm going to say it's uh, fiction. You do have the shiny, chromey looking you know, caps. But on late model cars that have tire pressure monitoring systems, the, the valve stem is actually aluminum in many cases. And then the other end of that aluminum stem is the very expensive sensor. So what happens is you can go get your chrome caps that are either steel or brass or copper or whatever they are and attach that to the aluminum and you start to get those two bimetals, dissimilar metals, and it will cause corrosion and actually ruin the valve stem. Yeah. So, well, so what kind of a mistake is that? What do you mean what kind? I mean, if you've got to get a new tire pressure motor. Well, I mean, oh. you could, you could, you know, Couple it could be a $50, $60 mistake per tire potentially. I mean, yeah. It could be no big deal either. It may take a while. It, I, w- I would say it's probably less of an issue here in, in Phoenix, but if you're Similar wet, snowy. wet, salt on the road, you add that to the mix. You get a definitely. battery. But you still can get, you know, quote, chrome caps. We have them. They're composite or they're plastic, and then they're just chromed on the outside, not on the surface of the threads. That's so. why I run curb feelers on my Honda Element, not chrome valve caps. And you got the little dice ones, too, on there, too, don't you? Don't lie. <laughs> David is element. Mm-hmm. David is element. So, anyway, that's your factor fiction for the day. Uh, hopefully, that helps. And in, in TPMS, you know, this time of year, it's great. Going on vacation, it's, I mean, that's really can be a savior for a lot of people getting on the road, bad tires or something. If you see those lights come on, make sure you get pulled over and get yeah. your tire pressure. I've been set. ignoring mine for about a week. And uh, so, anyway, and we are going for Wendy right now on her 2004 Ford Explorer. Wendy, what can we help you with? Hi, thanks for taking the call, and it's a very, very unique problem. Um, Uh We live in an area where we have a lot of rodents, and I've brought my car (laughs) in, and there's been rodent damage, and the mechanics are scaring me and saying that everything under warranty is going to be void uh, if this continues, and we don't know how to keep them out even when we park in the garage. Well, that is, uh, you know, a question that we had one of our first questions when, when Dave and I started, and as a matter of fact, I had a BMW in my shop, uh, the other day, and the people don't live in a rural area or anything, and the entire wiring harness on the right side of the car was all chewed up from pack rat damage. Well, it's simple to me. Just move. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> real easy, Dave. There was some... Uh, oh, my Ace, gosh. Ace Hardware, we found some some stuff. There's things you can plug in that make some sort of rodent detractant noise that we can't hear. Yeah, and there's... Gosh, send us... Please go to the website and send us an email. I saw some stuff about this the other day. There's... Like a cayenne pepper spray or, or something that you can put under the hood, and, you, and there's things you can plug into the wall. But most importantly, I want to get back to what the mechanics are telling her, that everything that's under warranty would be void. That's absolutely not true. Only related to yeah, what Yeah, I mean, if it, it, the wiring harness on, no, on any warranty 
is usually not covered. It sounds like you have an extended warranty because it's the 2004. But just because a pack rat chewed up a wire and the fuel pump goes bad, it has nothing to do with that. Or if your water pump starts leaking at the front of the car and they chewed on wiring for the taillight, that has nothing to do with anything. So don't, don't, be, don't be worried about that. Uh, I would just be focused on figuring out how to, how to keep them out. So shoot us an email, and we will find some more information for you for sure. Thanks so much for the call. We appreciate that. All righty, we've got up next Luis or Lewis uh, from Phoenix on his PT Cruiser, 2002 PT Cruiser. What can we do for you today? How are you doing today, guys? Great. How about you? Uh, a couple months ago, I had got my uh, timing belt uh, changed because they said that they were getting chewed up because the alternator was, like, crooked. But they, they fixed that problem, and uh, and now uh, now that I, every time I accelerate, it's like making like this really high-pitched noise every time I keep going. Like a squealing noise, kind of like that bird? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like even when I first turn on the car, like in the morning you could hear it, but when I accelerate, that's when it starts getting higher and higher. So like a like a belt squeak, you think, or a bearing? Well, it sounds like a belt squeal to me because it happens, you know, in when it's morning. cold and you accelerate. Now you said that t- they changed the timing belt because the alternator was crooked. Yeah. That doesn't quite sound right to me. Maybe the serpentine belt is what they changed. Oh yeah, that, that, and, that might be it. Yeah. Yeah, and what happens in some cases? Maybe there's a rubber bushing that the alternator bolts to, or there's a bracket that may have gotten bent, and so the belt isn't properly lined. So you'll start to chew off or wear off the one edge of the serpentine belt. So we still got a belt problem or alignment issue there. But do you see the confusion there between a timing belt and a serpentine belt? They serve two completely different purposes. And a timing belt is, is an, kind of more of an internal engine driving thing Yes, versus a yeah. serpentine belt. It's not internal in the fact that it's lubricated, but you can't open the hood and see it. It's behind it. Nobody t- can quickly company. look at it and say, oh, your timing belt's bad. Right. So, so probably... Probably a belt alignment issue. Get it back to that shop. And if you're not comfortable with that shop, bumper to bumper radio.com. List of great shops there. Any one of those shops can help you. So hopefully that, that helps you. And uh, Patrick, with his 2000 GMC Sierra, what can we help you with in your car, Patrick? You're on bumper to bumper radio. Thank you. Uh, like I said, I got a 2000 Sierra. And about the last three to four weeks now, when I turn to the right, about 30% of the time, it feels like there's no power steering that way. It's, uh, there, there's, there's nothing. But it doesn't, it's not all the time. The, the fluid level is correct. I, I don't even, I got no idea what to even start with. It's just on, on right turns. Just on the right. If you turn to the right, if you turn to the left, no problem. And again, it's, Maybe 25, 30% of the time. Uh, I'm 60 years old, so I remember when there was power steering was an option. Uh, back in the old days, I mean, that's what it feels like. Is But there's no power steering when I turn to the right 25, 30% of the time. And how fast are you going again when, when you're having this difficult steering? Uh, typically it's when you're, you know, going, you know, Two, three, five miles an hour in a parking lot, uh, that sort of thing. And is this a diesel? No. No, it's the, not. Okay. No. Uh, gas engine, uh, what is it, Three, 350. Right. You know, basic, base, your basic uh, Chevy GMC. Well, you know, I had a truck that had, you know, it was lifted at one point, and I had, but it was a diesel, and you have Hydro Boost, where that's where the power steering helps you with. With the with the brake assist, and when you have your foot on the brake going into a parking spot, you go to turn the wheel. There wouldn't be any power assist there, but you know that doesn't sound like the case here. You could have, although I would think you'd have some squeaking. You could have a loose belt, not rotating the pump fast enough. But even as Dave frowns across from me, I don't think that's the problem. Maybe a a pressure relief valve hanging up in a pump. Yeah, um, the fluid could be bad. I know in some of the GM cars. With my problem, they were saying use right. a lower viscosity fluid. No. So maybe a, a power stream flush with a synthetic yeah. might work for you. So Dave, they can't hear you nodding your head. I know. Is that <laughs> is that is that rack and pinion steering on that one, or is that got a gearbox to it? Steering that gear. one, gearbox, I'm pretty. Sh- you know, I, I really it should be a straight axle actually. Two thousand suburban. No. It's oh no, Sierra. Sierra. I was thinking the Ford. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think possibly starting with just a power steering flush, it can't hurt anything. It may not fix it. I got the same um, thing going on in my it, diesel. I do a power steering flush, and it gets better. It gets better. Hey, yeah. Pat, I'm not confident in either of these guys' answers. Go ahead and send us an email <laughs> at, <laughs> at bumpertobumperradio.com, and, and I will research it, and I will get you a better answer than what these guys came up with. <laughs> you, 